Hello again. I'd like to begin with a quote from Dr. Francis Schaeffer's book, The God Who Is There. Here's what Dr. Schaeffer says. God has set the revelation of the Bible in history. He did not give it as he could have done in the form of a theological textbook. Having set the revelation in history, what sense then would it make for God to give us a revelation in which history was wrong? God has also set man in the universe which the scriptures themselves say speaks of this God. What sense would it make for God to give his revelation in a book that was wrong concerning the universe? The answer to both questions must be no sense at all. Christians say that the Bible is true. Now we can't prove that in every single detail. For instance, we haven't seen heaven, so we can't prove from observation whether what the Bible says about heaven is absolutely true. We didn't exist before the creation of this universe, and therefore we cannot prove from observation that whatever the Bible says about God's pre-existence is absolutely true. But as Francis Schaeffer pointed out, there are areas of knowledge which are open to human investigation. Contrary to what sceptics say about the Bible, the Bible is not a book of myths, fairy stories or fables. The Bible contains many factual references which can be investigated. The Bible talks about history, biography, geography, biology, meteorology, astronomy, and so on. One of the frequent claims made against the Bible is that the Bible contradicts science and therefore science has proved the Bible to be wrong. Many books have been written on this subject and I've got quite a few of them here in my library. A question to be raised in regard to this is if the Bible is so unscientific, if Christianity is so unscientific, why are there so many scientists who are Christians? And that includes leading scientists. And if belief in God is unscientific, then why did the complexity of the DNA molecule lead Anthony Flew, a former leading atheist, to change his thinking and to declare in 2004 that he now accepted the existence of a God. I can't possibly deal with the whole issue of science and the Bible in just one short lesson. But what I want to do today is to raise some thoughts about this issue. And I do stress that I'm raising some thoughts about this issue starting with the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. And at the very beginning of that chapter, we read in Genesis 1 verse 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now, some people have described that as a summary verse, a sort of heading to the rest of the chapter. So they say that in verse 1, it summarises the fact that God is the creator. And then in verses 2 through to the end of the chapter and on into chapter 2, it explains step by step how God did that. But I must question that idea. If Genesis 1 and verse 1 is simply a summary statement, then we don't begin with the details until verse 2 and following. And verse 2 begins with these words, the earth was without form and void. So if, if verse 1 is just the sort of heading, then in verse 2 we begin with the idea that the earth is already there. We've got no explanation of how it got there. And so in view of that and in view of certain other factors, then I'm led to the conclusion that Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 is part of the creation process. The first thing that God did 
was to create the heavens and the earth. Now, that wasn't a, shall we say, completed step. In other words, the earth as God created it in Genesis 1, verse 1, was not the earth as it was to become, nor was it the earth as we now experience it. It says in verse 2, the earth was without form and void. So in other words, the uh, earth was... Um, it needed to be shaped and it needed to be filled with life. And also, if, if you read uh, the following verses, the indication is that initially the earth was covered by water. So uh, the material uh, that formed the earth needed further work, and that takes place through the rest of the chapter. And indeed, that may well be the case with the heavens as well. Because if, in verse 2, the earth is not fully formed, then it may well be that the heavens, which were also created in verse 1, were not fully formed. And thus we see, as we go on later in the chapter, that the, uh, the sun, the moon and the stars are brought into the picture. Uh, so uh, we have a start. God creates the heavens and the earth, and then God goes on to bring it to the way that he wants it to be. Well, so far, so good. We don't have a problem thus far. Um, currently, the, the most accepted scientific theory regarding the origins of the universe is what we call the Big Bang Theory. And uh, as uh, Dr. David Wilkinson says, the Big Bang Theory is currently the best model that science has of origins. Now, the Big Bang Theory says that the Earth and the universe had a beginning. Uh, that wasn't always the view, but that is now the view as a result of that concept. But the Bible's been saying that all along, that the Earth and the universe had a beginning. So thus far, science and the Bible are in agreement. But as we go on, then we start to run into problems. And I want to focus particularly in this lesson on the issue of light and the uh, stars and the sun and so forth. Uh, God goes on in Genesis 1 and verse 3 to create light. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Encyclopedia Britannica ex explains light as electromagnetic radiation that can be detected by the human eye. It also says that light is a form of energy and that light occupies a very narrow band of the total number of wavelengths comprising electromagnetic radiation. But we have some problems regarding Genesis chapter 1. First of all, you'll notice in verse 1 that God creates the earth before he creates the stars later in the chapter. Now, science tells us today that the stars must come first in order to provide the necessary elements to form planets. A second point is that God creates light in chapter 1 and verse 3, but he doesn't make the sun, moon and stars until chapter 1 verses 16 and 17. A third point, God speaks of day and night in Genesis 1 and verse 5, but again, the sun doesn't exist until chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And furthermore, God creates vegetation in chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, but he does so before the creation of the sun in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. So all of that may well sound to us rather illogical and unscientific. That raises a question. How are we meant to interpret the language of Genesis chapter 1? The Bible, just like modern English, uh, uses a whole range of language styles. There is narrative, commands, instructions, poetry, including dramatic poetry as we have in the book of Job, uh, 
There's parables, there's various figures of speech, there's proverbs, there's verbal illustrations, and so on. And some of this is intended to be interpreted literally, in other words, in accord with the actual meaning of the words, and some is intended to be understood figuratively, not in accord with the actual meaning of the words. Let me give you an illustration here. Somebody visiting Sydney from Darwin at the moment might say it's freezing, whereas somebody flying to Darwin today might say, oh, it's boiling. Now, neither freezing nor boiling in those statements have literal meanings. It's not literally boiling or freezing, otherwise we'd be dead or close to it. But rather, we're speaking in relative terms, saying Darwin is quite warm and Sydney is quite cold in comparison. And so in the Bible, we recognise that sometimes there is literal and sometimes figurative language. In his book, God, the Big Bang and Stephen Hawking, Dr. David Wilkinson lists several approaches that people use in regard to the early chapters of Genesis. Number one, uh, it can be treated as literal history describing the creation of the earth and the universe in six, six actual 24-hour days. Number two, some people propose what is called the gap theory. They insert a gap of long age between verse 1 and verse 2. And they say that during that period, as a result of the activities of Satan, the earth entered into a long history of ruin and destruction, resulting in the state described in verse 2, and therefore there had to be reconstruction from verse 3 onwards. Then there's the day-age approach, which sees each day of creation in Genesis 1 as symbolic of long ages of evolution. But we run into a problem uh, with that, just as we run into a problem with the gap theory. The gap theory really has no evidence. If you were reading it, you wouldn't come to that conclusion just from the language. The, the gap theory is only there to try to make Genesis uh, agree with the current views of the long age of, of um, the universe. Similarly, with the, uh, the day-age approach, which simply, some people are simply trying to reconcile Genesis 1 with evolution. But the problem is, even if you want to say each day represents a long age, we've still got the issue of the earth being created before the stars and of vegetation being created before the sun. So that's no solution. Then we've got what uh, David Wilkinson describes as the revelatory approach. And uh, this sees Genesis chapter 1 not as six days of creation, but as six days in which God described creation to Adam. But the problem with that would be that uh, a passage like 20, uh, Exodus 20 and verse 11 would need to be uh, written as in six days God explained the heavens and the earth rather than in six days God made the heavens and the earth. And then a fifth view raised by Wilkinson is what he calls the literary approach. And this says that the early chapters of Genesis are not meant to be understood literally. Instead, they're meant to be understood as a figurative uh, presentation, if you like, of theological rather than scientific ideas. In other words, they're an allegory in which the account, the allegory, indicates to us that there is an all-powerful God, and yes, the universe comes from God, and God rules over the universe, and God rules over humanity, but God also has a special relationship with humanity. So that's what is called the literary approach. Now, that last one, that literary approach, would be quite appealing to a number of people because we wouldn't have to worry about any attempt to harmonise Genesis with modern scientific theories 
regarding cosmogony, uh, biogenesis and evolution. However, I have a problem with simply um, regarding the early chapters of Genesis as merely figurative. Um, there's several problems here. If the early chapters are merely figurative, then when do we start taking the Bible literally? What uh, passage is there that tells us to switch from figurative to literal understanding? Uh, now, some people might say, well, maybe the whole Bible needs to be taken figuratively. But as I said at the beginning, there are many, many parts of the Bible which show themselves to be historically, geographically, biographically accurate, to be literal. And then also, if Genesis, uh, particularly chapter 1, is meant to be taken figuratively, then what do we do with verse 1? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Do we take that figuratively as well? Did God or didn't God create the heavens and the earth? And in fact, uh, another question is, well, is God himself to be taken literally or figuratively? Maybe the idea of God is not uh, accurate. Well, I can't go along with that because as I've talked about in various other lessons, there's enough evidence, particularly the life, death, burial and resurrection of Christ to point to the existence of God. And then I raise a third point too with viewing these early chapters merely as figurative. If you go over to Genesis chapter 5, you have very precise mathematical information there regarding the genealogies. And the interesting thing is, if you do the number crunching with the ages of the various patriarchs and when they were born and so forth, you come to precisely the situation in Genesis chapter 6, which is that Noah and his family are the only surviving remnant of righteous people prior to the flood. All the other righteous ones had died prior to that time. So there's... A variety of reasons why I cannot just simply dismiss Genesis 1, 2 and following as uh, being figurative. So it's here then that we come to a parting of the ways and we have to acknowledge that there are differences between particularly Genesis chapter 1, the biblical account of creation and modern scientific theory. Uh, even if we choose to talk about parts of Genesis 1 being taken figuratively, we've still got a clash because I come back to the fact that uh, the Bible says that the earth existed before the stars, which goes against modern scientific thinking, and that vegetation preceded the sun, which again goes be, uh, uh, is uh, in contrast to modern scientific thinking. Uh, or just plain scientific thinking for that matter. So, here then is a major question. Is it possible and logical for an all-powerful God to talk about creating light before sun, moon and stars and to create vegetation before sun, moon and stars? Well, an initial thought is this. The sun is not the only source of light. In my reading, uh, it talked about two uh, sorts of light, luminescence and incandescence. Luminescence is light, is where an object uh, at relatively cool temperatures is a source of light. And I would imagine that this includes bioluminescence, which is the situation where you've got certain fish and certain insects that produce light uh, in darkness. So you've got luminescence and then you've got incandescence, light emitted as a result of heat. For instance, stick a piece of wood in a fire and you will see that it will eventually be glowing red. Now I'm not saying that that solves the whole problem, but I'm saying that it is a consideration that we are not absolutely dependent upon sun for light to exist. And in fact, if we have God in the picture, 
then the Bible reveals a number of occasions in which God strongly produced light uh, apart from the sun. For instance, when God brought Israel out of Egypt, it said that he led them at night by a pillar of fire. And that wasn't just providing light for one or two people. That was sufficient to provide light for thousands of people so they could see where they were going. Or if we go to Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through to 9, we have there the, the, the Magi who were led to Jesus by what is called a star. That star brought them from the east to Jerusalem and then led them south to Bethlehem, even pinpointing the house in which the infant Jesus was. Now we can't explain that as a natural star, as a planet, as a comet, or as a meteor. So God there was using some object of his own making to guide these men. You go to Luke chapter 2 and verse 9, you have the glory of the Lord which lit up the night sky around the shepherds after Jesus was born. And then, uh, if you go over to Acts 9 and verse 3, uh, you have the fact that a light from heaven flashed around Saul of Tarsus as he was approaching Damascus. In fact, we have Saul's, or Paul as he later was known, Paul's account of this over in Acts 22 and verse 6, and he says it was a very strong uh, light. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. A light apparently greater than the noonday sun. So you have these various references to God providing quite powerful light. And so if you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, if God provided an alternate uh, source of light and the earth was rotating as it does, then that would explain at that point light and dark, day and night, evening and morning ever before God created the sun. But that in turn leads to another question. Why would God do it that way rather than creating the sun right from the word go? Well, on one hand, I have to say, well, really, I don't have the answer to that question because I don't know the mind of God. But I remember having to consider this years ago and, and I thought about it and I thought, well, it may well have something to do with uh, what humans would start doing later on. You see, the Bible tells us that God, was, God is able to anticipate the future. He foresees issues that, arises, uh, that, that will arise and he's able to make plans to deal with them. For instance, uh, you've got uh, an illustration of that over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through to 20, which talks about how God planned redemption through Jesus Christ ever before he created the world. He knew that sin was going to be issue, an, an issue. And he says, it says there in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20, Jesus Christ was foreknown before the foundation of the world. God had made plans long before the earth came along. Now, if God was able to foresee the problem of sin, then you'd say that he also foresaw the way in which sin would occur, the various forms of sin. And it says in Romans chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, that one problem was that human beings would begin to worship the creation rather than worshipping the creator, God. And that raises the concept of sun and moon worship and also of astrology. And even though some might not worship the moon, they still see the moon uh, as a sort of divinity. Now by describing the creation as God does, uh, by doing it that way in Genesis chapter 1, what was God indicating? That the sun nor the moon were of uh, priority. They, they were not of the greatest importance and they were certainly not uh, deities. Uh, 
In fact, the earth existed and the universe existed before sun, moon and stars. And this idea that the stars guide your destiny is also ruled out. Uh, something to add to that, several writers point out that in Genesis chapter 1 verses 14 through to 19, God doesn't say sun and moon. God simply says lights. He doesn't give them names. Just indicate that's what they were. They were just lights. They were not deities. They were not dis uh, uh, controlling human destiny. They were just physical objects put there by God to achieve a certain function. So, where does all of this lead us? Well, I know that I haven't proved Genesis chapter 1 uh, to be scientifically acceptable. I haven't proved modern scientific theories to be wrong. But what I've tried to show is that there are thoughts and explanations for what Genesis chapter 1 says and the way in which it says it. We can't just dismiss Genesis chapter 1. And you say, well, why does the Bible have to be so difficult? Well, the Bible itself acknowledges that there are some parts more difficult than others. For instance, we go over to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 through to 17. And the Apostle Peter there says that some parts of Paul's writings are difficult to understand. And if that's the case with some of Paul's writings, it's certainly the case with other parts of the Bible. But that doesn't mean that we need to throw the Bible out. Because there are various aspects of modern scientific uh, thinking which are hard, which are indeed very hard to understand. Modern scientific theory is not as clear-cut and as plain as we might sometimes like to think. For instance, in preparing this lesson, I just googled the question of how did the earth begin? And I found a site which had this question, what is the truth about how the earth was formed? This was not a religious site. And it said, the truth is, we don't know. And it goes on to talk about what is, and I quote, the currently accepted model. And as I, I read the article, I thought, oh, this is even different to what I read when I was a kid. Views have changed. And we're still not absolutely certain. Or, I've referred to Dr. David Wilkinson before in this lesson. Uh, he has this to say about the views of Professor Stephen Hawking, and let me say that Wilkinson held the greatest res regard for the late Stephen Hawking. But this is what he says. It needs to be stressed that Hawking's views on quantum gravity are speculative. That is, they are not widely accepted. Indeed, there exist other suggestions quite different to Hawking's which attempt to answer the same problems of initial conditions. Hawking's former collaborator, Professor Roger Penrose, argues for a different theory based on gravitational entropy. The lack of consensus in the scientific community should make us cautious about accepting any one theory at the present time. So if you've got questions about the Bible, then certainly there are questions in regard to science as well. I cannot explain every detail of creation, but there are many aspects of the Bible and of Christianity which I can understand and for which I do find abundant evidence. The Bible tells me that there is a God who created the universe, and on the basis of the evidence, I believe that. The Bible also tells me that beyond creating the universe, God also provided a saviour in the form of Jesus Christ who was crucified and then raised from the dead. And on the basis of the evidence, I certainly believe that. The former atheist, Anthony Flew, changed his beliefs and came to believe in the existence of a God because that is where the evidence 
led him. And in regard to God and the Bible, let me encourage you to consider the evidence and to see where it leads you. You can find a whole lot of books on this subject online or you can go to a bookstore like Kurong and they've got a lot of books. There's a lot of material and written by, in some cases, highly respected, trained scientists that do not see a problem between the existence of a creator God and the world and the universe as it now exists. You really can believe. Let's pray. Father, you have given us a record of your activities, your thoughts, you've communicated with us through your word and within that word is a great deal of evidence to tell us that we can believe it and accept it as a reliable source of your communication with us. We can also look at the world and the universe and see evidence of design uh, evidence that this didn't just all happen by accident. Father, help us to open our minds to thoughts about this. And if we have not done so, to really consider honestly, objectively, uh, the nature of things. Uh, to see that uh, it is all pointing towards you. Thank you that you have provided the evidence the information and thank you for those who help us to understand that information. Help us to come to belief, help us to grow in belief. We pray through Christ. Amen. I realise there's a lot more to this subject and I do again make the point there is a great deal of material available on this if you would like to explore it and uh, you can get it online or places like uh, Kurong. Look after yourselves in the week ahead. If we can be of help, uh, you've got ways to contact us. You've got various links that appear on screen. And I hope to be with you again next time. Until then, look after yourselves. Bye for now.